Next on ITV, host Louise McNamara explains good health habits and how the body works to first and second graders on All About You. My name is Louise McNamara, and this program is called All About You. This is the first in a series of programs. The purpose of them is to help you understand more about yourself and about other people, too. Haven't you sometimes wondered about questions like, what's inside me? What am I made of? What keeps me alive? And... How did I get to be a baby? Why do I keep outgrowing my clothes? Why do my teeth fall out? What makes me get sick? What happens to all that food I eat? Why do I feel like running and skipping sometimes? Why do some people wear glasses and others wear hearing aids? Why do I feel the way I do? Sometimes mad, sometimes sad, or glad, or afraid. And why do I look like me and not like anybody else? And haven't you wondered why do people keep telling you? Use your head. Use your head. Hmm? Haven't you wondered about questions like these? I thought so. Well, together we're going to try to discover answers to your questions. And perhaps in the end, you'll know what you are, what makes you you, and what keeps you alive, and much, much more. Right now, here's a friend of mine that's going to help us. This is the Tin Man. The Tin Man is a robot. As you can see, he's made of, or supposed to be made of, machine parts. There are buttons and switches. He's made of cog wheels and axles and pistons and put together with nuts and bolts. Inside, he's made of springs and wheels and gears. What can he do? Oh, well, first watch and then tell me. What can he do? Yes, he can walk on two feet, swing his arms, make a noise, and he can go backwards as well as forwards, right. How many of these things can you do? Oh, you can? Show me. Stand up and do it, along with Mr. Tin Man. Ready? Okay, good. Now press your button and sit down again. You certainly can act like a robot or a machine. Now, does that make you a machine, does it? Let me ask you another question. Can the Tin Man do all the things that you can do? Can the Tin Man cut with a pair of scissors? Can he hit a puck with a hockey stick? Can he jump rope? Can the Tin Man read a book? Can he write a letter? No, he can't do any of these things, can he? He can't even eat an ice cream cone, which is too bad. Why? Well, the Tin Man is a robot, and he's not alive. He's not alive, and he doesn't have a brain, but you do. 
without a brain, he doesn't know what's going on around him, he can't think, he can't decide how to act, and he doesn't have any feelings at all. Now, are you a machine? No way, because the robot is not alive and you are alive. In fact, you are more like this ivy plant than you are like the Tin Man because the ivy plant is alive. Plants, flowers like the African violet, and fruits and vegetables like this tomato plant are alive too. They can't move around like you do, but they're alive and growing. Are you a plant, a fruit, a flower, a vegetable? <laughs> no, of course not. Well, let's think what other kinds of things are alive. Hmm? Animals, animals are alive, yes. There are many kinds of animals and they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. I'll bet you can think of lots of them. Big ones, small ones, some in between. And some are very tiny, like the animals in this pond water. Oh, they're in there, mm -hmm, they really are. But they're so small that you can't see them without the help of a microscope. So let's take a microscope, which makes things look bigger than they really are, and take a look at a drop of pond water. I'll put just one drop on this glass slide, and then focus it so that I can see clearly. What you're going to be seeing is a cucumber-shaped animal called a paramecium. It's a very simple animal and very tiny. There, there it is. Can you see it? It's so simple, really, that it's hardly more than a blob of jelly. You can see the inside as well as the outside. You can see right through it. Now, here's another animal, one that you don't need a microscope to see. These furry animals, where are you? Hi, are called gerbils. Maybe you've seen gerbils before. This is peanut butter and jelly. The female gerbil is peanut butter and the male gerbil is called je jelly. And they can eat and breathe and as you can see, they can have babies. They have four babies who are only 10 days old. And they can move around and feel things happening to them. Hi. Would you like your nest back? There you are. Now here's another animal friend of mine. This is Sandy. Sandy is a squirrel monkey. Hi Sandy. Hi there. See his long tail? That's a prehensile tail. That's a big word, isn't it? Prehensile means grass. With his tail, he can grasp or hold on to things just as well as with his hands. Hey, Sandy, Psst, look, what have I got? Look at his hands. See, tiny little hands. Sandy, want a cookie? Want a cookie? You deserve it. He'd rather exercise. Monkeys, gerbils, paramecia, cats and dogs. They're all animals. They're alive and growing. They can move around. And so can you. Are you an animal? Yes, you are. You're a very special kind of animal. You're a human animal. Oh, I know, you're people, but people are human animals. Now, if I say the word animal, what do you immediately think of? Do you think of a camel or a giraffe or a donkey or an elephant? You think of animals like these, don't you, instead of humans like yourself. 
I suppose that's because we're so different, and we know it. Human animals, that's you and me, can do so many more things than other animals like gerbils and monkeys can do. What kind of things? Well, things like these. other animals do things like these, do the Mexican hat dance and build a tree house? Well, there are many reasons, but the most important reason is because they don't have brains like yours. They can't begin to do things with your brains, their brains, that you can do with your human brain. By now, you know that the brain is a very important part of the body. Well, what about the rest of your body? What's it like? How's it put together inside? If you weren't covered all over with skin and hair, it would be easy to know the answer, wouldn't it? But since you're not a paramecium, we have to look at a model of the human body in order to find out. If this is the first time you've ever seen a model of the human body, hang on to your hat. Let's go. Beneath the layer of skin on your chest are these bones. These are your rib bones. And lying behind the rib bones are your lungs. This is what you breathe with and what you blow up a balloon with. When you breathe in, fresh air goes into your lungs. And when you breathe out, the used air goes out. This, in the very center, see the shape of it? Is your heart, right. In your body, it's about as big as your fist, and its job is to keep your blood moving. It's a pump. Here is the liver. The liver is a storehouse for many of the important things that you need in order to stay alive. We'll take the liver out, and here's something that you say is empty when you feel hungry. What is it? That's right, the stomach. This is where your food goes after you chew it up with your teeth. In your stomach, it gets broken up some more, and then it goes into this long, winding, curling tube called your intestines. From the intestines, it goes out into your blood, travels all over, and gives you energy. The food that isn't used passes out of your body as waste when you go to the bathroom. Now, what about this organ up here that we've talked so much about? What is it? Yes, it's your brain. Right. What you have seen are some of the larger organs in the human body. There are other smaller ones, of course, and we'll talk about them another time. When you look at a model, you can't tell what the organs feel like. Soft and spongy like lungs, or firm like the heart, or liquid like the blood. But more important, when you look at a model, you can't tell what these organs do in a living body, because in a model, they aren't doing anything, so we have lots left to learn about them. Next time, we're going to be talking about a part of the human body that is harder than any plastic ever invented, that has over 200 pieces, and that grows as you grow. Do you know what it is? Can't guess? Okay, there's a puzzle for your brain. About You is a project of the Agency for Instructional Television.
Next on ITV, host Louise McNamara explains good health habits and how the body works to first and second graders on All About You. WSKG TV, Binghamton. and Patty have been studying the Plains Indians at school, so they decided to make a teepee of their own. First, they made a frame of sticks, which they covered with burlap cloth, and now they're having some fun painting Indian symbols on it. It looks good, doesn't it? I wonder, does everything have to have a frame in order to hold it up and give it shape? Well, a house does. A window does. An umbrella? An umbrella does, sure. It has a frame that holds the cloth out so that you'll be dry when it rains. What about people? Do people have frames inside? Do I? Do you? Do you have a frame inside your body? What do you think? Let's see if we can find out just by feeling our own bodies. Try feeling yourself here, here, or here, 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 I don't care where, here. Do you feel those hard parts inside? What are they? Bones, yes! You have a framework of bones inside your body, just like the teepee has a framework of sticks. But Lisa and Patty used only six sticks making their teepee, and you have a framework of over 200 bones. Why, that's a lot. Where are they all? Well, there's your head bones, your neck bones, your shoulder bones, your arm bones, elbow bones, hand bones, finger bones, uh, chest bones, rib bones, hip bones, thigh bones, knee bones, leg bones, ankle bones, foot bones, toe bones. Whew! There you have it, over 200 bones. And they're all put together in a special way to give you your shape and to make your frame. Would you like to see how all those bones are put together? Okay, let's go visit a guest, mm, a special guest in the next room. Mm. This is Ms. Bones. Now, what do you think of her? Well, she must be chilled to the bone. Ms. Bones is, do you know what the word is for this frame of bones you have? The word starts with S, say it, skeleton, right. Ms. Bones is a skeleton, and you have a skeleton right inside. Only yours is smaller, and yours is alive and growing. Have you ever seen a real one before? I want you to notice Every bone is different. Each bone in this skeleton is different in size and in shape. But in one way, they're all alike. See if you can guess what it is. Watch while I try to bend just one bone in this bone's arm bone. You ready? Okay. <clears throat> nope, won't, won't bend. Why not? That's right, because her bones are so hard. And that's why they won't bend. What about yours? Will they bend? Let's try it. Grab your arm in the same place. Use the same bone. Now, bend as hard as you can, or press. Does it bend? You can't? Oh, why not? That's right, because your living bones are hard, too. They don't bend. You know, your bones have to be hard for two very good reasons. They have to be strong enough to hold you up, and they have to be firm enough to give you your shape. Most of the animals you know, dogs and cats and frogs and bats, they all look the way they do because of the special way their skeletons are put together. Do you 
know what animal this skeleton belongs to? Now, I'll bet right away you knew it wasn't a toad and that it wasn't a crow. This is the skeleton of a cat. And a cat looks the way it does because of that special way its bones are put together. So, a cat will never be mistaken for you, and you will never be mistaken for a cat or any other animal, I hope. Now, do all living things have to have bones? Well, let's see. What about a jellyfish? Mm. Can you see any bones inside the jellyfish? I don't feel any bones inside the jellyfish. Do you see how limp and floppy a jellyfish is? Just like the paramecium we saw last time through the microscope. Remember, it didn't have any skeleton either. Neither do worms or germs or bugs or slugs. They don't have skeletons. Well, their bodies are so small they don't need bones to hold them up. But you do, and I do. Without skeletons, why, we'd all be just as limp and floppy as jellyfish. But wait a minute. Didn't we just say that the bones in Ms. Bone's skeleton and the bones in your skeleton were hard and don't bend? Well, if that's true, then how come we aren't just stiff all over like this? How come we don't stand like this and move like this? Well, you know that we don't do that. Let's see if we can find out why. Take a look at your hands. Now, you don't go around with your fingers sticking out like this all the time, do you? Why not? Well, let's take a look at just one finger. One finger doesn't have just one bone inside. It has one, two, three separate bones inside. You can feel the places where the bones join, here and here, and that's where your fingers bend. So even though your bones are stiff, you can still bend your fingers. Oh, the place where one bone joins another is called a joint. And without joints, your fingers would just be as stiff as sticks. It wouldn't be easy to um, pick up a spoon in order to eat or to hold a pencil in order to write. Now, if you've got some other joints somewhere else in your body. All right, let's find out. Do this with me. There's your shoulder joint, right? What else? There's a elbow joint, okay? And how about the wrist joint and your neck joint. Okay. Are there any others? How about your head? Hmm. Put your fingers right here on that little bump right in front of your ears. Can you find it? Now press very hard and say something silly with me like, um, hello Ms. Bones. How do you do? I've got as many bones as you. <laughs> Did you feel something moving? What was it? Yes, the part that you felt moving was the joint here at your jawbone. And without the joints right here in your jawbone, you couldn't talk, you couldn't chew, you couldn't yawn either. In fact, without joints all over your body, you really couldn't move or walk or run. You couldn't talk. You couldn't eat. You couldn't do much of anything at all. Of course, all the bones in your body are very important. But there's one that does the most to help hold you up and to let you bend. And that is your backbone. Right. And since you know that your backbone bends, then you know that it must not be just one long bone. So let's look at Ms. Bone's backbone and see how it's made. 
Look very closely. Do you see that Ms. Bone's backbone is really made of lots of little separate bones all, all fitted together? There's a special name for this chain of movable bones. It's called the spine. And each bone in your spine is joined to the one next to it. There, you see? Your head sits on one end of your spine and you sit on the other. Now, there's something else that your bones do for you besides hold you up, let you bend, and give you shape. You may already know what it is, but in case you don't, I'll give you a hint. What does the cage do for the canary? Yes, it, it helps keep the canary inside. And what else? Uh, suppose there were a, a live cat in here instead of just the cat skeleton. That's it. It helps protect the canary from being hurt. All right. Now, what about the bones in your skeleton? Well, put your hands here on your chest. Press. Do you feel those bones? What are they? Yes, they're your ribs. Some people call them the rib cage. And they are like the bar. They are like a cage. I mean, they're bars with spaces in between. And just as the bird cage helps to protect the canary inside, your rib cage helps to protect certain soft organs inside. To help you remember what some of those soft organs are, let's go take a look at the model that we saw before. Now, here's the chest bone and the ribs. That whole thing is the rib cage. What are these soft organs behind the ribs? These soft, spongy ones that you use to breathe with. Right, those are your lungs, okay? And here's an awfully important organ, almost in the center, lying behind the lungs. What's that? Your heart. Good. Oh, and don't forget this large, soft organ lying here, your liver. Now, you see, if you didn't have your ribs, your rib cage, to protect all these soft organs, they might get hurt accidentally if you fell down. Okay, where else do your bones protect you? How about your head? Feel your head. Is it hard? <laughs> it feels like just one big, hard, rounded bone, doesn't it? What do you suppose it's like inside? Is it um, bone all the way through, or do you think it could be hollow? Well, I've got a monkey skull here that will help us find out the answer. You see, the top of the skull can be taken off so that we can look inside. Ready? There. Did you guess hollow? Ah, good for you. Then you guessed right. But are you really empty-headed? Certainly not. The skull covers a very important organ inside that you need in order to think and to stay alive. What is it? Your brain, right. And in this model, we can take a look at one half of the brain. Do you see how nicely the skull covers the brain or how neatly the brain fits inside the skull? Now do you know why the bones in your head have to be so hard? Exactly, because the brain is a soft organ and it must be protected from being hurt. And you do need your brain. We've been using ours a lot today, haven't we? And mine, to tell the truth, is getting a little tired. So I think I'll relax and go watch somebody else work for a change. Bye now. Well, Lisa and Patty, how are you doing? About You is a project of the Agency for Instructional Television. Next on ITV, host Louise McNamara explains good health habits and how the body works to first and second graders on All About You. WSKG-TV.
Binghamton. Frank are with me today, working on a marionette show they're planning to give for the kids in our neighborhood. Tara's working on a sign for the show, and Frank's been busy untangling the strings on his main character, the ogre. Is he workable yet, Frank? Um, yeah, almost. Okay, let's test him. Okay. Can he move his legs? Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Can he nod his head? He does. What about his arm? Can he move the arm with a club in it so he could clout someone on the head? Um, well, this is me. No? Yeah, no, not yet. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. And you can't be an ogre without being able to do that. Yeah. Why don't you fix him? Okay. Okay, fine. Well, I guess you know now what makes the ogre move. What is it? Strings, that's right. What about you? What makes you move? Do you have strings on you? Then what do you have inside that moves your skeleton and lets you move your arms and legs? I'll give you a hint. Has anyone ever said to you, you sit still and don't move a muscle? Right. You have muscles inside your body, and that's what makes you move your bones around. Without your muscles, you wouldn't be able to move your bones any more than the ogre could move his arms and legs without his strings. Here's another question for you. Have you heard anyone say, that man is all muscle, have you? Some people do have larger and thicker muscles than others. That's because they exercise their muscles a lot. But is anyone really all muscle or all fat? Nah, some people do have more fat on their bodies than others. But no one is really all fat or all muscle, because under our skins, we all have the same number of bones and muscles in our bodies. Do you remember Mr. Bones? He's only a skeleton with no fat or muscle on his frame. But he has the same number of bones in his body as you have in yours. You have over 200 bones in your body. Did you know you have 600 muscles to move them? Well, you have. I wonder, can you see your muscles move? Can you feel your muscles move? Let's find out. Do this. Close your fist tightly and make a muscle. Can you see something move here in your own arm? Can you feel something move? Put your hand upon your arm. Do it again. All right, and once more. So you can see and feel muscles moving inside your own body. Other animals have muscles inside their bodies, too. Look at these wildebeests running with every muscle they've got. And the ostriches, which muscles do you think they're using the most? That's right, their legs. And these animals must have, they need muscles in order to get away from dangers. And I think you recognize him. Look at the muscles rippling under the zebra's skin. Now you've seen a lot of muscles. Well, how do they work? I can show you an animal that can move by itself in almost the same way that each of your muscles moves. Are you in here? We've got you. Can you guess? Mm-hmm. Just a plain old earthworm. But look at him move. <laughs> Watch now. Watch how he bunches up in one place and then lengthens out. Now watch right here. He'll bunch up. Wait a minute. He bunches up, and then he l relaxes. He lengthens out. 
The earthworm moves by bunching up and then relaxing. That's when he lengthens out. This bunching up movement is called contracting. And this is what each of your muscles does, too, every time it moves. But for you, just having muscles that contract isn't enough. To move you, the uh, muscles have to be attached to something. And I think by now you know what that is. What is it? Bones, yes. Say, have you ever looked at a turkey wing before it was cooked for dinner? Raise your hands if you have. Good, hands down. Well, that is what it looks like. Have you ever wondered what do the muscles look like inside? And how are they attached to the bone? Well, I have another turkey wing here with the skin taken away. Watch while I move it. See? Now, do you see anything moving or changing shape? Mm-hmm. That is a muscle right there. Now, this muscle is attached to this bone over here. How do you think it's attached? Well, let's follow it. Here's the muscle, the fatter part, and it thins out into, oh, do you see this? It's a thick white band or cord that attaches the muscle to the bone over here that it moves. These thick white cords are called tendons. You have tendons in your own body, tendons that you can see moving. Watch. Wiggle your fingers. That's it. And keep wiggling your fingers and pretend you're playing the piano. Okay. Do you see those cords moving in the back of your hand? Feel the move. If you could see under your skin, you would see that those cords look like the white cords that we saw in the turkey wing because they're tendons. You have many, many tendons and muscles all over your body. You have big ones and small ones, tiny ones, all over your framework. Now let's take a look at, how, at some of the more important muscles and tendons in your body. Everybody up. Everybody stand up while I go get some more help. Tara and Frank, would you mind stopping what you're doing just for a minute and coming over here and helping me? Good, okay. Well, where should we begin? Let's begin with our foot. Tara, would you mind taking off your shoe? All right. And now everybody do this. Press your heel against the floor and move your toes up and down, just as if you were pushing on a pedal. That's it. Good. Now, press with your fingers at the back of your heel. Really pinch hard. Do you feel that thick cord moving inside? What do you think it is? Mm-hmm. It's a tendon. That's right. It's the tendon that attaches your leg muscle to the bones in your foot. All right, keep pedaling. And run your hand further up your leg and press again. Now, do you feel something moving inside? Contracting and relaxing, contracting and relaxing. What do you think it is? Right, it's your leg muscle or leg muscles. Now, run your hand a little further up, and this time press on both sides of your knee. Do you feel two thick cords inside? You do? Well, I think by now you know what they are. Tendons, yes. They are tendons that attach muscles in your legs to the bones in your legs. Good. Where should we look for um, muscles to feel next? Good idea, Frank. OK. In your chest. Everybody, put your hands on your chest and press hard. Now, take a deep breath and take another. Do you feel your chest move? Your rib cage moves every time you breathe, doesn't it? Well, do you think that you need muscles in your chest in order to breathe? You bet you do. What about your head? Do you need muscles in there? Do I need muscles in my face in order to talk to you? Yes, I do. And to thank Tar and Frank very much, if you want to, you can go back and finish working on the marionettes. And you may sit down. OK? Where were we? 
oh, on the face. Put your hands here and press hard while you bite down. Bite again and again. Do you feel those tough, strong muscles in your face moving your jawbone? Good. What about your eyes? Do you need muscles to move them? Can you wink? Can you blink? Let's see you do it. Let's see you wrinkle up your nose. And do you need face muscles to do this? To lift your eyebrows? What about, what about your ears? Oh, can you do this? Watch. <laughs> can you wiggle your ears? Well, you may not be able to, but don't worry about it because it's really nothing very special to be able to do. But it does go to show that there are muscles in your body that you have to learn how to use. As a matter of fact, did you know that there was a time when um, you couldn't even walk? Surprised? It was when you were a baby. Your balance at first wasn't really very good. But you were determined to learn how, so you went on waddling and toddling and falling. But you kept trying. And then you had to learn how to run until most of you, boys and girls, can run just as well as six-year-old Philip because you've trained your muscles in how to run. You know, you also have to learn how to use uh, the smaller muscles in your body, too. Here's an interesting thing you should do sometime. Get out some of your old school papers and take a look at how you wrote your name when you first learned how. This is how Kathy wrote hers. Do you see how the letters don't quite meet on the lines? Her Y is not very good. The letters go this way and that. Now, this is the way she writes it now. Which is better, the first or the second? The second one, yes, of course. Because Kathy has been working hard, telling the muscles in her hand exactly what it is she wants them to do. But you know, she has other muscles in her body that she doesn't have to think about. She has some muscles that just work or move by themselves. One of the most important ones is the one right here. If you're very, very quiet, maybe you can feel your own heart beating. Your heart is an amazing muscle that isn't attached to any bone, and it just goes on working, letting blood in and squeezing it out, pumping like that, day and night, whether you're asleep or awake. And it does this all your life. My goodness, we've learned many things today, all about all the good things that your muscles do for you. But they do need help. Next time, we'll talk about what you can do for your muscles. OK? <laughs>is a project of the Agency for Instructional Television. Next on ITV, host Louise McNamara explains good health habits and how the body works to first and second graders on All About You. WSKG TV, Binghamton.
uphill is tough, but bike riding is still my favorite kind of exercise. What do you like best? Whatever your favorite kind of exercise is, whether it's jumping rope or climbing or swinging, it's good for you, and it makes you feel good, too. Do you think that other animals besides ourselves like to play? Well, I have a basket of kittens here beside me. Let's see what they like to do. Let's just watch them for a bit. Hey there. Hello. Who's mewing? What's the matter with you? Don't you like my yarn ball? Oh. Maybe they're just too young. When they're very young, like these kittens, mostly they like to play with each other. See how he's biting his friend here? It's the kitten's way of getting ready to do the things that cats need to do. And they're just busy exercising their muscles, training their muscles and their brains to do the things that they need to do later, like pounce upon a fast-moving object. To show you that it's not just pet animals that like to play, let's take a look at some young baboons near their home in the wild. Here they are. Three little baboons. Now, what game do you think this is? Could this be called King of the Tree? Whoops, he's not king anymore. Hey, I'm coming too. <laughs> There's mother supervising their play. Why do you think the kittens and baboons spend some time at play each day? Well, yes, for some of the same reasons that you do. They have bodies that need exercise, just as you have a body that needs exercise, too. What is exercise? Is this exercise? Is this what we mean by the word exercise? Is this exercise? The boy doesn't have to move very much to watch TV, does he? Is this exercise? So, what's the difference? Yes, you're right, exactly. In order to get exercise, you have to really move your muscles. There's nothing wrong with relaxing, but it is bad never to get any exercise. If you don't get any exercise, then you'll end up with a weak body, and I know you want to have a strong body. Besides having a weak body if you don't exercise, you won't feel so good, and you won't look as good, and maybe you won't be as charming or as much fun to be with. Do you think that you need strong muscles? Why? Yes, you need strong muscles for them to do the work they have to do. And you know what that is, don't you? Things like sitting, standing, walking and running and jumping and just about anything that you can think of. Do you think that the human animal has always needed to have strong, anim uh, strong muscles? Let's think back long, long ago to a time when man first lived on this earth. His brain hadn't dreamed up a house yet. Maybe he and his family crouched under a rock ledge for protection. But mostly he lived outdoors. He had to hunt wild animals for food. He had to be strong enough to run fast and sometimes to fight off dangerous wild animals. You and I have bigger and better brains than the first men did, but we have the same kind of bodies with the same kind of bones and muscles. And our same kind of bodies still need exercise. They weren't meant to sit still all day. Hey, I'm thinking of someone who's never still for a minute, except when she's asleep. Can you guess? A baby. That's right. Even when you were a baby, you exercised every day. Before you could crawl or creep or walk, you wiggled around a lot waving your arms and kicking your legs, you were getting ready to move on your own. You were also doing something else good for yourself. You were helping your spine to take shape. When you were first born, 
your spine looked straight. But now that you're older and more grown up, your spine looks like this. Do you see how it curves out and in and out and in again? Maybe you can feel the curves in your own spine. Did you know that the curves in your spine allow you to do something quite special? Let's see if you can find out what that is. Stand up. Okay. Now, if you have enough room, take four walking steps forward. Stop. There's the answer. Do you get it? You alone uh, can walk upright on two feet. Good. That's it. Now you can go back and sit down again. No other animal is as comfortable walking on two feet as you are. Look at this gibbon ape. He's swinging through the trees very gracefully, using his arms. He could never learn to walk as well as you do. Now, when he comes down to the ground, do you see how funny and awkward he is? Why, he has trouble keeping his balance. No, he could never learn to walk as well as you do. And since you are able to walk well on two feet, then make sure you do it. Do it with pride. When you walk, stand up, proud and tall. Hey, let's play a game. Without moving your feet, just move your body any way you like. Ready? When I say the word freeze, I want you to hold absolutely still. Do you understand? Okay, just keep moving like I am. Freeze. Don't move a muscle. Do you see how you can make your muscles hold your body any way you want, even though they don't like it? You can train your muscles almost any way you want, but you wouldn't want to train them so you stood all the time like this, would you? I hope not. It's uncomfortable, it's tiring, and it's not good for your spine either. Okay, go back and sit down like you usually do, nice and relaxed. But I hope when you're sitting down and relaxing that you're not slumping. You wouldn't want to teach your muscles bad habits like that. Do you know the difference between sitting up tall and slumping? Watch, here's a slump for you. Now you do it. You slump too. All right, now look around at each other to see how you look. How do you look? Mm, terrible. Do you know what would happen if you sat like this all the time? Mm-hmm. Your muscles would learn to do it. So now tell them to do this, to sit up. And now how do you look? Wonderful. Good. Luckily, we can train our muscles to do what we want them to do. And how do you keep your muscles and make your muscles strong? That's right, by exercising them, by using them, by moving them, by playing every day, outdoors if possible. Here's a game you can play the next time you go out for recess. It's called Duck, Duck, Goose. Everyone sits in a big circle and one child is it. He taps the others saying duck, 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 and then goose. Then Goose gets up and tries to tag it before it gets back to the empty place in the circle. Watch. That goose is fun to play, and as you could see, it's good exercise, too. Of course, it's not always possible to play outdoors. I know another great game that's good for indoors. It's called Tiger Hunt. Everybody get down on your hands and knees. Come on, let's play it. You repeat everything after me exactly as I say it and as I do it. You ready? 
Okay. Let's go on a tiger hunt. Put on your knapsack. Put on your gun. Ready? Let's go. I see some tall grass. Gotta go through it. Coming to a bridge. Gotta go over it. Uh oh. Coming to a river. Gotta swim over it. Mosquitoes coming to a swamp. Gotta go through it. Coming to a tree. Let's go up it. Look around. I see a cave down the tree. into the cave. I see two yellow eyes. It's a tiger. Run! Up the tree, down the tree, through the swamp, over the river, over the bridge, through the tall grass, About You is a project of the Agency for Instructional Television. Next on ITV, host Louise McNamara explains good health habits and how the body works to first and second graders on All About You. WSKG TV, Binghamton. fascinating toy. It's a steam engine. Have you ever seen one like it before? Isn't it wonderful? Did you see that wheel go around? Steam was turning the wheel around. And when I hit the other lever, steam blew the whistle, too. This water tank is awfully hot. I wonder what's making it so hot. Yes, I suppose there's something burning inside, making the engine go like gasoline makes a car go. Oh, I wonder what this is. Ouch! Whoops! Let's take it out carefully. Oh! Hey! Something is burning. Look, I can light a match by it. 
So this must be the fuel that makes the little engine go. To work, the little engine needs to burn fuel, to heat the water, to turn it into steam, to push the wheel around. Well, this is all very interesting, but what does it have to do with you and your body? Well, what do you need? And what does the little engine need in order to keep going, moving, running? What do you think? Fuel, that's right. And here's the big question. What's your fuel? You take it into your mouth. Right, food. Things like hamburger and pickles and cookie and milk and bananas. How do you feel when you've just fueled up? You feel full, don't you? And how do you feel when you need some more fuel? That's right, you feel hungry. Say, I hope you had a good breakfast or a good lunch. Because if you haven't, you might be feeling something besides just hungry. You might be feeling tired or headachy or cross, and I wouldn't want you to feel any of those things. What was the last food you ate? And where is it now? Point to where you think it is. Mm-hmm. And how did it get there? That's right, it went into your mouth and then into your stomach. How did it get into your stomach? I'll show you how it didn't travel there. Suppose you were to take a handful of raisins and eat them. Would they go into your stomach just like these raisins falling straight down the tube? Hmm? No, that's just silly talk. Your food doesn't fall down inside you, and you certainly don't have a glass tube inside your body. <clears throat> well, then what does happen to the food after it gets into your mouth? Right, first of all, you chew it. Let's see. Let's just pretend that you can eat the raisins. Go ahead, do it. Chew them up. What happens? You use your teeth and your tongue in order to break them up and mash them into little pieces. What else happens to the food in your mouth while you're busy chewing? Hmm? Yes, it gets wet. There is saliva in your mouth that wets the food, making it easier to swallow and easier to chew, too. Have you ever heard anyone say, mmm, that makes my mouth water? Does this make your mouth water? It does mine. Let's pretend that you can take a bite of the cake, chocolate cake, with frosting and nuts on it. You go ahead, have some. I'll have some, too. Mash it around inside your mouth and swallow it. All right. Now, take another bite. I'll pretend to take one with you. And what happens? Put your fingers here on your throat and feel what happens when you swallow the cake. Do you feel muscles moving inside, helping to push your food down? Are you sure you do? Do it once more. Swallow again. Yes, there are muscles in your jaw and your tongue and your throat that all work together to help push your food down what we'll call your food tube. Now where is your imaginary bit of cake? Where? In your stomach. That's right. Do you remember which of these organs is your stomach? Is it this one? This one? This one? Good for you. It's this one right here. The stomach, I'll take it out, is shaped like a sack or a pouch that can change shape and stretch. It gets bigger when you've just filled it with food, and it gets smaller when it's empty. Now you know where your imaginary piece of cake is, in your stomach. But how is it going to get to all the other parts of your body? How is the cake going to get to your brain and your fingers and your toes? Is the cake going to go to your brain and the frosting to your fingers and the nuts on top into your nose? Oh, what a ridiculous idea. No, it doesn't happen like that at all. Something special has to happen in, inside your body to the food. It has to be broken up into little tiny pieces. It has to be digested. When we say that something has to be digested, we mean that it has to be broken down into such tiny pieces that the tiny pieces can be carried to all parts of your body by your blood.
now what happens to the food in your stomach is just the beginning of digestion. The walls of the stomach are made of muscle that squeeze and help to mix your food all up. From the stomach, the food goes into this long curled up organ called the intestine. You say it, intestine, good. The intestine is also made of muscle and that's to help squeeze and push the food along while it's being digested. Intestine is a long word for a long organ that's curled up tightly to save space. Like, um, like the telephone cord is all curled up in order to keep it out of everyone's way. If your intestine were stretched out, why it would uncurl like this and there wouldn't be any room left for anything else like your heart or your liver or your lungs. Now you know where your food is digested. What about how? You know how sugar melts in your mouth and turns into liquid? Well, the juices I talked about before, juices pour into your stomach and into your intestines and they sort of melt your food and turn it into liquid. Someday when you're older you'll understand how this is done. I can give you an idea, however, of what it looks like when the job is done. This is a blender. Maybe you have one at home or have seen one at a soda fountain. I'll plug it in. And then I'll take this good lunch that we saw before and put it in the blender. Milk, pickles, cookie. Mm-hmm. Well, hamburger, all right, and the roll. Let's see, a little banana. Assuming you eat some banana, all right. Now, let's turn it on. That should do it. There. <laughs> That's what your food looks like when it's being digested. Not very pretty, is it? Well, now, let's be serious. What's the point of turning all this good food into that runny, soupy stuff? That runny, soupy stuff, remember, is your fuel, and it has to be carried to all parts of your body, and it has to be a liquid so that it can get into your blood. How does this liquid food get through your intestine and into your blood. Does it get there all at once? Does it go through one opening or many? Let's use our imagination. Let's pretend that the cloth on this bowl is the lining of your intestine. And we'll pretend that the liquid here is the liquid food that's inside your intestine, that runny, soupy stuff. Let's see what happens when I put some of it on the cloth. Drip, drip. Is anything coming through? Yes, you can see it coming through in one place and then many places. And in fact, it's beginning to turn the water a different color. Well. Your intestine isn't made of cloth, but it does let liquid food pass through in much the same way. The food has to be liquid in order to get into the blood. Now, think for a minute. Of all the food that you eat, does all of it just go into your body and disappear there? Remember the little steam engine it didn't use up all of its fuel, did it? Some of it was still left in the pan at the end. And what do we do with the waste that's left in the pan? Right, throw it away. Well, your body does just about the same thing. You and the little steam engine are rather alike. Because the muscles in your intestines take waste food and pass it into this part here, the bigger part of your intestine. Let me take it out so I can show you the back side. 
The waste food goes into the bigger part of the intestine, it gets stored for a while, and then it gets thrown away. It gets pushed out when you go to the bathroom. Now, you know two ways that you and the little steam engine are alike. You both need fuel, and you both make waste. Let's play a little game to see if you understand now the path that your food takes, all right? You help me by filling in the missing words. Your fuel is food. First, you put it in your mouth where it is chewed. Then the food goes down your food tube and into your stomach. That's right. From the stomach, the food goes into the intestine where it is di digested. Most of the digested food passes through and into your blood and gets carried to all parts of your body. What's left over is stored for a while and leaves your body as waste. Very good. Now, here's something that you might like to do when the program is over. Make a map that will show that you know where your supper is going tonight. <laughs> About You is a project of the Agency for Instructional Television. Next on ITV, host Louise McNamara explains good health habits and how the body works to first and second graders on All About You. WSKG TV, Binghamton. I shouldn't tell you this, but I hate to go grocery shopping. It means lugging all these big brown bags home, and then when I get here, I still have to unpack them and put everything away. So why do I do it? Oh, I think you know. Yes, because my family and I have to eat in order to stay alive. So do you. So do all animals. They need food to get the energy to keep them on the go. And young living things need good food get the building materials to help them grow. And we all look better and feel better when we eat well. It gives us that healthy glow that uh, even my gerbils have. Hi, fellas. How are you feeling? You hungry? Do you see what nice, healthy, shiny coats they have? Their coats shine. They look well. They're bright-eyed. They're plump. Not too fat, not too thin. And they're alert and curious that's because i feed them well they love these sunflower seeds besides it's fun to eat whether it's shish kebab on a stick from indonesia or a bowl of brown rice with bits of fruit in it or eating sticky barbecued spare ribs with your fingers 
or that old favorite, a slice of pizza. It's all food, and it's all good for you. When you were a baby, your mother fed you. At first, you drank only milk. Later, she chose other foods for you, but she chose them. And now that you're more grown up, you're not only able to eat many different kinds of food, but you sometimes choose them. So there's some things that you ought to know so that you will know what to choose. Are some foods better for you than others? What are the best ones? How many kinds of food do you need to eat to be strong and alert? Will one food alone do it? or just two or three? That's a lot of questions. Here's another. How many of you like apples? I thought so. Then you like to bite into a big, delicious, juicy apple, don't you? Me too. Good. If you like apples so much, how come your mother doesn't just give you apples to eat? She wouldn't have to spend so much time shopping or cooking. She wouldn't have to set the table. And she wouldn't have to wash dishes afterwards. She could just say, OK, everybody, supper's ready. Come and get your apples. No, I didn't think you would like that idea. Besides, your mother and the people in the cafeteria and the restaurants where you eat wouldn't do that to you. They know that there are four important groups of food and that you need to eat some of each every day. Let's take a look at the groceries I bought and see if I bought home, brought home some, something from each one of the four food groups. Maybe you don't know what the four food groups are. That's okay. We'll sort them out and you'll figure it out for yourself. What's first? Well, this big bunch of green celery. Celery is a, do you know? Yes, it's a vegetable, and that belongs in the fruits and vegetables group. All right. An orange. An orange is a fruit, so that belongs in the same group, fruits and vegetables, remember? Chicken. Now, that doesn't, isn't a fruit or a vegetable. It belongs somewhere else. Where? Yes, you're right. It's meat, and that's going in what I'm going to call the meat group. Whoops, another orange. Oh, noodles. It says egg noodles. Noodles are made with flour, and flour is a grain. So this belongs in another group. It's called the breads and cereals group. I always buy milk. Milk belongs in its own group, called the milk group. Now we have something from each of the four. You can help me. Here's a pound of butter. This might be a little bit tricky. Do you know what butter is made from? Oh, good, you did know. Butter's made from milk, so it goes in the, right, in the milk group. Good. A package of green beans. Right, fruits and vegetables group. Oh, eggs. Now there's another one that's a little tricky. Eggs belong in the meat group. You can either eat meat or eggs at a particular meal. So we'll put that there where it belongs, beside the chicken. Makes sense. Oh, this is pudding. Do you know what pudding is made with? You must have made it before. It's made with milk, so it belongs in the milk group. Good. Now, let's see. Here's a big box of breakfast cereal. Cereal? Right, it belongs in the bread and cereal group. What about, oh, beautiful grapes. What about the grapes? That's right, they're fruits, so we put them with fruits and vegetables. And another fruit, bananas, right? Good. Let's see, what else? Oh, a bag of rolls. What are rolls? They're really little loaves of bread, aren't they? So they go in the bread and cereals group. Cheese. Cheese, like butter, is made from milk. Good. Lettuce. Lettuce is a vegetable, right? Oh, here's one of your favorite meats, I'll bet. Hamburger. 
Right, it goes in the meat group. Just two more things. Bologna makes a good sandwich, and it goes in the, you're right, meat group. And finally, what's this? A big bag of potatoes, and they go in the fruits and vegetables, because potatoes are vegetables. So, there we have it. We've sorted out our food into the four food groups. Let's make sure you know what they are. You tell me the names of them. The meat group, right? The fruits and vegetables group, the milk group, good, and the breads and cereals. Very good. Now, there's one more thing. You not only have to eat foods from the four food groups every day, but you should eat regularly. Three times a day is best. Suppose you forget to eat. Suppose you skip a meal. <laughs> you may forget, but your stomach doesn't. It tells you that it's empty. It rumbles and it grumbles, and sometimes it even hurts. And you may feel like the terrible-tempered Tom O'Toole, who never ate breakfast before school. All day long, no one heard Tom O'Toole say a pleasant word. He wouldn't read, he wouldn't write. He seemed to want to pick a fight. His teacher said, I must find out what this fuss is all about. No breakfast. Good heavens! No wonder, she said, Tom's stomach is empty. So is his head. I know you don't want to have any of the problems that Tom had, so you be sure to eat breakfast every day. Oh, hmm, all right. Suppose you do have to get it yourself. Well, even if you're late for school and you're in a big hurry, you can still have a good breakfast. You can do what Emily did. Oh, you see, breakfast doesn't have to be a problem. And lunch is easy, too, because most of you can get that at school. And you usually have dinner at home. And I'd better start thinking about what we're going to have. Let's see. We want something from each of the four food groups. Maybe you'd help me pick it out. Let's have um, chicken and green beans. And I'll bake some potatoes. There's the potatoes. Whoops. Let's see, we'll have some rolls, and that goes with butter. And then we'll have some milk to drink. And then let's see, maybe we'll have some apples for dessert. But you know, you have to watch out that you don't get too much of a good thing. Because, well, if I ate three good big meals a day and a lot of sticky snacks in between, what would I look like? Fat. That's right. Oh, dear. And being fat just isn't good for you because your body has to work too hard to keep you healthy. So, I hope you'll never do what poor Porky did. He went to a carnival, and this is what he ate. Three hot dogs with everything. You know, mustard and relish and ketchup and onion. And he had a whole box of French fries. He drank four soft drinks. Three candy bars. A whole big box of hot buttered popcorn. A 
A bag of roasted peanuts. Oh. And to top it all off, he had a big dish of ice cream. Oh, you. And you know, poor Porky never got to ride on the roller coaster. And I think you know why. Talking about all this food today has made me hungry, and I really must think about dinner. So I guess I'd better start putting these groceries away. Bon appetit. Bon appetito. Disfrute la comida. Chef Ponte. Bye. <laughs> About You is a project of the Agency for Instructional Television. Next on ITV, host Louise McNamara explains good health habits and how the body works to first and second graders on All About You. WSKG-TV, Binghamton. you're going to learn about today? Yeah, me! But I don't even have to listen. Know why? Because I've got 100% fewer cavities than any other teeth. How come? Because I'm plastic, that's how come. I'm lucky, I guess. I never get cavities. I never ache. I don't even have to be brushed. Well, dusted once in a while, maybe. But I'm a perfect example of good mouth-keeping. In fact, oops, someone's coming, quiet. Hello, I thought I heard someone talking. Gee, it's dark in here, I'll get some light. There. Why, there's nobody here. I want, I wonder, no. No, of course not. That's ridiculous. Teeth can't talk by themselves. Can they? Well, anyway, hi. I'll bet you can't guess what we're going to talk about today. What? You know? Then, then you know that we're going to talk about teeth and how you can have healthy, happy teeth. What do I mean, healthy, happy teeth? Let's see. Is this a healthy mouth? It's good for Halloween, but I wouldn't want to see it on you always. How about my mouth? Is it healthy? Well, I have to work hard at it, but yes, it is, and that makes me very happy. Just about everyone can have healthy teeth if they want to, and we're going to find out how. First, though, let's learn some more about teeth, your teeth, and what's happening to them. How are the faces of these boys and girls alike? That's right. 
they're all missing some teeth. Right now, maybe you are missing some teeth. Right now, maybe you have one or two holes in your smile. Oh, and maybe you have a loose tooth. Raise your hand if you have a loose tooth or some falling out teeth. All right, hands down. Do you think that uh, missing teeth or loose teeth are anything to worry about? No, it isn't anything to worry about. What you're losing are your baby teeth, and your 20 baby teeth are supposed to fall out. In fact, if they weren't falling out, we'd all be pretty worried about them. I wonder, do you know where your baby teeth came from? Well, some babies are born with one or two teeth showing, but on the day you were born, you probably, like most babies, had no teeth at all. But hidden away underneath your gums were some tiny little beginnings of teeth called tooth buds. They were growing before you were born, when you were still growing inside your mother. They're called tooth buds because they grow into teeth, just as flower buds grow into flowers. And after you were born, the tooth buds grew down through your gums and up through your gums, one after another, until you had your baby teeth, all 20 of them. And now that they're all in, they're falling out. And other teeth, your permanent teeth, are growing in. Let's see if I can explain what is happening to you. Here's a set of teeth quite a bit like yours. Now watch. Right up here in the upper gum, above your baby teeth, are another set of tooth buds. These are your permanent teeth. Here and here, where there are no baby teeth, are two permanent molars that haven't grown in through your gum yet. Above these baby teeth, you can see permanent tooth buds of different sizes. They're different sizes because they're growing at different times not all at once. You wouldn't want to lose all your teeth at once, and you'd be toothless all over again. This one, the biggest tooth, uh, tooth bud, permanent tooth bud, is probably growing the fastest of all. And as it grows down, it's putting pressure against the baby tooth below it. And the pressure is helping to loosen the baby tooth until finally it falls out. And let's see what's happening in your lower gum. The same thing's happening, really. See? Here and here are those two permanent molars, your 12-year-old and your 6-year-old molar. They haven't grown up through the gum yet. And then below your baby teeth, you can see those permanent tooth buds. Each one of them will grow up. And as it does so, it'll put pressure against the baby tooth above it which loosens the tooth until finally, you know, it pops out. Why is all this happening in your mouth? Why do you need a second set of teeth? I'll give you a hint that will help you answer that question. It's really another question. Are you bigger or smaller than when you were a baby? There, you've got it. You're bigger and you need bigger teeth. I've got some baby teeth here that I've saved over the years. Let's see. Here they are. I bought them back from the tooth fairy. <laughs> and uh, can you imagine what I would look like if, if I, uh, well, what I would look like and what I would eat like, how I would chew if I had to work with just baby teeth in my grown-up mouth? Let's just take one and see. Look. Hmm, just a little too small, right? <laughs> so, there is a tooth truth for you. You are growing a second, larger set of teeth to fit your mouth as it grows larger. A set that will last you all your life. All your life? <laughs> Not if I can help it. Goodness, you scared me. Who are you? I'm Lactobacillus. Louis Lacto for short, the meanest tooth destroyer in the whole kingdom of tooth decay. I make good teeth sick. I make them hurt and ache so bad 
that sometimes they have to be pulled out. You do that? All by yourself? Well, no, not quite all by myself. I'm a member of a gang, see? We're keen and we're mean. And when we get together, we chop holes in teeth. How? First, we move into a warm, wet mouth where teeth haven't been brushed for a while. Then we find all the leftover sugar. It's easy when someone has just eaten a sticky, gooey piece of candy. And in less time than it takes to watch a TV program, we turn all that sugar into acid. Acid! Yes, indeed! And you know what acid does? It, <laughs> it burns holes like this into the hard tooth enamel that covers the tooth. And pretty soon, we've eaten away lots of the inside of the tooth. And if nobody finds us, we can get away inside and make the tooth hurt. And you know the rest. A trip to the dentist, a cavity to be filled, or a tooth to be pulled. Oh, that's awful. And you mean to tell us that you and your gang do all that? Well, not quite. We do have what you might call some outside help. I'd like you to meet one of our best helpers, Miss Lily Lollipop. Hello, you all. Hello. What have you been doing, Lillian? Well, so far today, I've tempted three children to eat lollipops right after breakfast, six other children to help themselves to molasses kisses, and I have just left two children chewing some sugary gum that... Good, great, bravo! And I hope you didn't mention brushing or, or rinsing or, or flossing or anything like that. Heavens no! I know my job! That's enough. Shoo! Get away, both of you. We <laughs> heard enough. <laughs> Quick, what can we do to make sure that they keep away? What can you do to break up Louis Lacto and his gang in your mouth? That's right. Brush your teeth. I know, you've heard that a hundred times before, but it's true. And I hope that you not only brush after eating and before bedtime, but that you also remember to brush in the direction in which your teeth grow. I'll show you what I mean. Down on the ones that grow down and up on the ones that grow up. Oh, and don't forget to brush the tops. You really can break up Louis Lacto and his gang with your toothbrush. And if you brush hard enough, you can brush them right out of your mouth. Louis and his gang not only make acid, though, they leave a mess around your teeth and gums called plaque. It's a collection of Decaying food, dead germs, acid. Ugh. You may have noticed this yellow and white fuzzy stuff on your teeth, have you? Well, your toothbrush has a friend that can help you get rid of plaque. It's dental floss. Ask someone in your family if they'll get you um, some unwaxed dental floss. And be sure they help you use it the first few times. Here's what you do. Wrap each end around a finger on each hand, like that, and then go visiting the spaces between your teeth. See, wait a minute, like this, and pull the plaque up. Now, when you do that, scrape the side of this tooth and scrape the side of the tooth next to it, like that. See what I mean? This and this, and pull the plaque out, okay? You can do it, just be sure you do it often. Oh, and there's another way you can treat your teeth right, and that's to eat the right kinds of foods. The same kind of foods that help build strong muscles and strong bones will also help you to build good, strong teeth. And don't let that Miss Lily and Lollipop tempt you too often between meals. Try carrot sticks, celery sticks, apples, any kind of fruit. Um, crackers and milk, peanuts, popcorn. 
instead of all that sugary candy and gum. And let me see, isn't there one more thing? Oh, yes, that's it, of course. Visit your dentist. I'm glad you knew that. Your dentist will help you take good care of each healthy, handsome tooth. And there's another tooth truth. <laughs> About You is a project of the Agency for Instructional Television. Next on ITV, host Louise McNamara explains good health habits and how the body works to first and second graders on All About You. WSKG TV, Binghamton. Just trying to finish this um, house that somebody started building. It's like finding a jigsaw puzzle unfinished. I just can't leave them alone. The house is terrific, isn't it, with the chimney and the skylight and the balcony? But the wall wasn't finished, so I've been adding some more blocks to it. We're getting there. You know, in some ways, you and this house are alike. Does that sound strange? I'll bet it does. Well, what is the house made of? That's right, it's made of blocks, little plastic blocks. You too are made of blocks, only yours are living blocks. You are made of little tiny living parts called cells. Did you know that? Well, no one knew that until a man named Robert Hooke started exploring the world with his microscope. His microscope didn't look like the modern one that I have, but it did the same thing. It made things look bigger. And he was interested in making things look bigger so that he could see them better. Let's take a look at some of the things he might have looked at through his microscope. Just a sec till I get this speck on here. Hmm. This is a grain of salt. Under the microscope, you can see that it's really lots and lots of crystals shaped like boxes. Pretty, isn't it? Here's another kind of crystal. Isn't it fancy? Maybe you already know what this kind of crystal is. That's right, it's a snowflake, which is a crystal of ice. People didn't even know that a snowflake was so beautiful until people like Hook started using the microscope. Fascinated by what he saw and growing more curious, he began looking at living things like plant leaves. Imagine his surprise when he looked at a plant leaf and found that it was made of these oddly shaped things. He decided to call them cells. And so, by using the microscope, Robert Hooke learned that all living things, big and small, are made of tiny living parts. Let's take a look at a model of a cell. This model is designed to give you an idea of what the important parts of a cell are. All around the outside is a thin skin. This thin skin, or cell membrane, holds together some watery, jelly-like stuff inside. The watery stuff 
here and everywhere, has a name, cytoplasm. That sounds nice. You say it. Cytoplasm. Many different parts of the cell, as you can see, float around inside the cytoplasm. One of these parts, and the most important one, is here in the center. See this? It's called the cell nucleus. It's important because it has the job of telling the cell what to do. And a cell can do things. It can take in food and oxygen and water. It makes waste. It can make new materials. And it can grow. Exactly how the cell knows that it's supposed to grow and exactly what the cytoplasm is made of that makes it alive are big mysteries. And many people are trying to solve it. Some things are known, but there are many things waiting to be discovered, perhaps by you. But there are even bigger mysteries than a single cell and how it grows. <laughs> what about a baby like Val? Who's Val? Val's a little boy, 11 months old. He's the son of a friend of mine who's working, and so Val's staying here with me for the day. What's so mysterious about a baby? Well, like you, Val started as one cell. And look at him. He's grown into a 20-pound human being. And even now, right this very minute, Val is growing into a full-grown man. Think of it. Oh, it will happen. Don't worry. I was bald and toothless and this size once myself. Now, how is Val, with his little feet and legs, his little hands and arms, his little body and his little head, going to grow? If he's made of tiny cells, how is he going to get bigger? How are his bones and muscles, his stomach and heart, his skin and his hair going to grow? Mm. Val, will you come with me? Come on. Remember the house and how I made the wall bigger? I added more, more blocks to it, didn't I? Well, just as the wall here grew bigger by my adding more blocks, your body grows bigger by adding more cells. That's right. From the time that you were the size of Val, you have added millions and millions of cells. And by the time you get to be the size of me, you will have added billions more. Let's see how this can happen. Here is a cell that is as big as it's going to be. And the nucleus, the pink dot in the center with the black specks in it, has just mysteriously told the cell that it's time to make another cell. Something happens first in the center of the cell. The nucleus breaks up, and the things that were inside the nucleus begin to split themselves into two identical parts. This picture, taken a little later, shows the splitting apart even more clearly. Where you saw one set of black spots called chromosomes, there are now two identical sets of black spots, all within the one cell membrane. Now the separation of the parts of the nucleus inside the cell has gotten so far along that something is beginning to happen to the outside, to the cell membrane. Do you see the dents in the cell membrane? What do you think is going to happen next? There, it happened. The cell membrane folded in and made a complete circle around each new nucleus. The cytoplasm, you see, divided into two parts. So where we started with one cell, we now have two, and they are identical or exactly alike. Now I want to show you a movie of a real cell dividing. It takes about an hour for a cell to divide, but the movie is speeded up. So watch closely. This is something you don't have a chance to see very often. See the black specks or spots, the chromosomes? floating around in the cytoplasm. You can see the cytoplasm moving. Well, the black spots are breaking up and splitting into two identical sets. And now they're separating and going to the two opposite sides of the cell. Remember, this is all happening inside of one cell. And now, stand by what's going to happen next. 
That's right. The cell membrane completely surrounds those two, and we have two cells instead of where there was one. The cell that we just saw was from the area around the heart. You couldn't be made of just heart cells, though, could you? And then you wouldn't be you. Instead, you'd be just one gigantic heart. No, that's a pretty ridiculous idea. Obviously, you're made of many more than one kind of cell. You're made of many different kinds of cells, all working together, helping to make you you. There are cells that make bones and cells that make muscles. There are cells that make blood and there are cells that store fat and so on. Let's go back to the microscope and take a look at some of these different kinds. This is a piece of bone. Bone is made of living cells, which you can see here as dark patches. They are surrounded by white, hard material, which is not alive. The cells make this hard stuff that gives bone its firmness and strength. It is this white, hard stuff you think of as bone, such as in your skeleton. But the white bone would not exist if the living cells were not there to make it. This time, you are looking at the kind of cells that allow parts of your body to move. Can you guess? Yes, muscle cells. Here you see one sort of muscle cells. The shape of these cells is quite different from others we have seen. They are long and skinny with pointed ends, and even the dark nucleus is long and skinny. Bundles of these cells lying side by side make up your muscles. This slide shows clearly how very different two kinds of cells can be and still be working right next to each other. The long, skinny ones are the kind we just saw, mm -hmm. muscle cells. And the fat, round ones are called gland cells. They make one of the many special juices your body needs. Do you see both of these different kinds of cells? Good. These bluish purple cells remind me of an octopus. They are nerve cells. Nerve cells all over your body carry messages either to your brain or from your brain. They have several arms sticking out so that each nerve cell can touch the next nerve cell to pass the message along. And these interesting shapes are liver cells. They're busy taking the material from the food you eat, turning it into new materials, and sometimes storing them for a while until you need them. These cells look quite chubby and full. And the nucleus in each is easy to see, isn't it? Did you know that that red liquid in your body, your blood, is also made of cells? Here are a hundred or more red and white blood cells. The red ones are shaded and the white ones are light in color. And there are also a few young red blood cells which show up much darker. The red cells pick up oxygen in your lungs and carry it around your body. The white blood cells help you to get rid of germs. They tackle germs that get into your blood and try to eat them. They may look harmless, but they're not to a germ. So, what have we learned so far by looking at all these pictures of cells? Well, we've learned that all the cells in your body aren't alike. They're not the same size, or the same shape, or the same color. Why do you suppose this is? You're on the right track if you think it's because they do different things. Yes, they do. Each kind of cell is made the way it is because it has a certain job to do, and no other kind of cell can do that job. You've learned a whole bunch of new things today. And I'll bet the next time you look at yourself, you'll see yourself in a new way. Because now you'll know, when you look at yourself, that your stomach and your heart, your muscles, your bones, your hair, your brain, your eyes, your nose, your ears, your mouth, your tongue, all are made of cells. And you also know that it takes many different kinds of cells, all working together, to make you what you are. Remember this, from the top of your head 
to the tip of your toes, you are a beautiful bundle of billions of cells. <laughs> About You is a project of the Agency for Instructional Television. It happens every day and night. It doesn't stop when you graduate or reach a certain age. We are all of us.